I'm Greg Stoller, and this is The Language of Business, now proudly broadcast on over 10 stations. Today, we'll discuss the business plan's marketing section, and in particular, how you go about implementing your plan of attack. At the end of the industry competitive analysis section, you've identified an unmet business opportunity. Now, it's time to capitalize on that opportunity, either by creating a new base of customers or appealing to your existing clients through your innovative product or service. But how do you avoid falling prey to the famous line from Robert Burns' poem in 1785, the best laid schemes of mice and men? During implementation, are marketing metrics carefully written down and analyzed, or are they instead developed over time based on customer feedback or moves by the competition? Let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of both approaches. Our first guest is Lisa Tanzer, whose resume speaks to over two decades of work either as a chief marketing officer or a marketing vice president, and within three of the last four years as a self-employed marketing and strategy consultant. Prior to attending the Harvard Business School, she also worked in a management and strategy consulting capacity. Lisa, welcome to Thanks. the Language of Business. Nice to be here. So you have extensive experience in education, television, media, children's products, and, and the entertainment fields. With such a diverse background, how have your marketing approaches had to be changed or analyzed based on your client or customer? Yeah, you know, every client or customer I've had is completely different with regard to the marketing plan. A lot of my background has been in children's entertainment or children's products, and you would think there'd be a lot of commonalities, but I can give you a couple examples of how the marketing plans could be completely different. Okay, please do. With children's products. Get the product on television, get it online, get the kids to get excited about it. And then, really think about the holiday season, because you're all leading up to the holiday season. So you've created some awareness, and then how do you get that translated into information over to the parent? And that's where all the in-home flyers and circulars around the holiday time come in. You're really working on retailer support in order to get presence but in the home. Most of that work in preparation for the holiday season is probably done in February or March the year before. Yes, definitely. A full year ahead. That cycle, that's a full year ahead, because you're leading up to one period of time, right, where you're trying to get the purchase. And then what you want to try to do is to reinforce with the parent right around the decision making time. So getting much closer to like the November time, how are they planning to feel good about their purchase? So the PR happens, right, with all the toy and of industry course, magazines, yeah. but those lead times are six to nine months ahead of time as well. So let's go back to your diverse background. Is there any common thread throughout all of your different marketing approaches and activities? It's really knowing what the key selling cycle would be and backing up, into, you know, backing up into the plan. But that differs quite considerably on what tactics you need to get to that purchase decision. So let's talk about some of those tactics. What has worked well over the years and what honestly hasn't worked well over the years? I think, again, it's like the variety. So in this case, you can really predict a little bit about the cycle and the consumer mindset with regard to toy purchasing. The other example I was going to give you is with test preparation services, it's totally different. You couldn't employ that same tactic. You couldn't employ a television advertising campaign right. leading up to a purchase decision. That's a much longer, longer cycle time so that you're in the consumer's mindset. And you can do that not with test preparation services, but with the knowledge you have about the category and colleges and, publi and, and publicity. Sure. Now the interesting thing about your background is I know from preparation for this interview that you were producing a television show that you were then airing. What is it like being on the other side when it comes to doing marketing this time from the production vehicle? Yeah, so it's, it's very challenging, right? Because your customer is really, is really the, the network. And the sure. broadcaster, right? You know, you need to get to them first. So a lot of your pre-marketing plans have to do with selling into the studios, not to your end consumer, because you're completely dependent upon them to reach your consumer. In that particular industry, is the lead time still weeks, months, or even an entire quarter away, or how does years, it differ? Years away, because you want to understand what are the needs of the broadcaster. So Disney Channel, what holes are they trying to right. fill? What's their long-term lead plan? It can take 18 to 24 months to produce the show, so you need to be understanding their needs and selling in concepts a lot earlier. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller, and my guest is Lisa Tanzer, currently a Chief Marketing Officer. So let's go back to my original question question, are there any common threads? Are there any lessons that you've gleaned in terms of the best one or two marketing approaches? No. <laughs> I really don't think there's a common thread per se with regard to marketing tactics and strategy. I think those are all very specific. Right. The common thread 
throughout any marketing to me is just understanding your customer. Okay. And that might be a customer like a broadcaster sure. or a consumer like your, your end consumer. Are there any similarities, and there don't need to be by the way, between how you go to understand that customer? Whether it being using analytical data, whether it be employing different approaches to say in this industry we need to employ X, Y, or Z to understand our customer, but in a different industry it might be A, B, or C. I think the basic commonality that I always have, and it's a really nitty gritty one, right. is talk to your customers. And it doesn't have to be in a big quantitative study. Right. It doesn't have to be in formal focus group setting. Get out there and really understand your customers. And I, I've started things in companies where I call it coffee with the customers, bringing yep. in just a handful of customers every week so that everyone in the company is talking to them and understanding them. Now in this age of social media, is this always in person, coffee with the customer? Have you been able to do this over Skype, over email, even sure. dare say a telephone conversation? <laughs> telephone. People use the telephone. People use the so. telephone. That, that's um, actually a landline. Right. They, um, Absolutely, you know, because you don't want to just be with your local market. So we will do a lot of, you could Skype, easily Skype with customers or do online surveying and that type of stuff as well. So with two decades of experience, I'm sure you've received, regard, regardless of the industry, your share of detailed quantitative and qualitative data. From what vantage point do you study this material? It really depends on what you're using the material for okay. and the type of business you're in. I'll give you an example. So any really staple consumer product, right. the data is invaluable to you because you have POS data, point of sale data right. on every SKU and every retailer, what you're doing. And because the business doesn't change that dramatically, looking back and analyzing what worked or didn't work can really like drive your entire marketing plan. So just for the benefit of our viewers, are you taking the raw data and then trying to analyze it based on an answer you're trying to achieve? Or are you basically just looking at the raw data and then making strategic decisions based on no, it? No, taking the raw data and analyzing it. Okay. So we ran a promotion during a certain period of time. Yep. What data do we want to analyze? What's the return on investment based on what you did in the past in order to inform the future? Okay. In other industries, um, looking backwards, doesn't help you all that much. Uh, the toy industry, Give us an example, would, toy right. industry would be a great example. Yeah. It changes so much from year to year on what's hot and what's not that of course you can get some general assumptions, but if you're launching a new product, the past data, because it's so trend related, might not be as important sure. of a driver. Of course. Um, in online businesses, however, you can use the data almost real time, right? If you're doing paid search or your SEO efforts, yep. and you can adjust your marketing plan daily based on that data. Okay, so it wasn't lost on me, and it shouldn't be lost on our viewers, that there's no smoking gun, there's no magic sort of common thread that's going to go across industries, et cetera, but is there any set of metrics which you find have consistently been applied? Again, I'll say no on okay. consistently. Which is a good answer, by the way. <laughs> but it depends on what, are, what did you build your business plan on? What sure. metrics did you build up your business plan and your model? So if your model was built on consumers and, and acquisition yep. and conversion metrics, then clearly those are the metrics you should use for driving your marketing plan. Right, of course, right. So it would really depend on the, the, the plan that you've put in place. Okay, so let's take a further step back. How would you then define, and I'm sure the answer is going to be ça dépend en français, it depends. Right. right. How would you define marketing success or failure? It's funny, because that one doesn't depend to me. Okay, good, <laughs> this, is, this is good. Right, this one doesn't depend. It's pretty clear to me that it's on profitable revenue and right. brand growth. Okay. So you could, um, I, I view my success or failure, did we make our numbers? Okay. First and foremost, but in a profitable way. But notice you're saying it from way. a revenue perspective, not necessarily from a profit, no, profitability profit, perspective. No, from a okay. numbers both ways. So revenue, revenue and brand growth, as well as profitability. Yes. Okay. And when I say the economics, it's clearly on the profit. Right. Because you can invest in marketing tactics that have a very negative return yep. on investment. That's not, a, that's not a success. So I'll look at all the tactics and say, which one gave me the greatest return on investment, meaning profit, you know, profit for the investment, right. and tweak up or down those, on those tactics. Okay, so we've talked about planning. Mm -hmm. We've talked about data analysis. We've talked about the success or failure quotient. How about implementation? I mean, we always hear about these very detailed marketing plans that are written as part of full-length business plans. Yeah. And depending on the company or the industry, some companies will have their VP of marketing write a separate detailed marketing implementation plan. How do you come out on that debate? I think you need the detailed plans, but it just depends on the level of detail. And so 
I view the marketing part of the business plan to be your roadmap. People should understand from there yep. what your overall budget's going to be, what kind of broad level strategy and tactics you're going after. But when it comes to implementation on any sort of promotion campaign, you, you need to go way down to a much deeper level. Excellent. Thank determine you. what you'll be measuring. Uh, obviously, what you'll be right. measuring Again, what, starting with mm -hmm. the end question in mind, right. what problem am I trying to solve, et cetera. Correct. Terrific. But what happens when your customer feedback is quite different than what you expected? Or the competition makes moves you never anticipated? How do you then change your marketing implementation on the fly or rely on the use of, say, gut feel amongst the executive management team? We'll find out next on The Language of Business when we speak with a self-described media innovation junkie. Sarah Fay has two decades of marketing experience with the media services industry and was a pioneer of the digital marketing space when she launched Cara Interactive and later helped Aegis Media to build its global digital marketing network, Isobar. She's become a well-known voice on the topics of social and mobile marketing and media integration. Sarah, welcome. Thank you for having me, Greg. Based on your LinkedIn profile, you've spent more than a decade as an advertising executive at Aegis, but for the past four years, your title has been free agent. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, free agent is the title I've given myself uh, because I work for myself. Uh, for, for 16 years, I worked as an advertising executive in the same company and, um, you know, basically worked for them. You know, a lot of the life choices you make are for, you know, for the company you're serving versus yourself. So as free agent, um, I get to do the things that I want to do and work with the people I want to work with. And I'm enjoying, you know, for these past four years, a new kind of career. What sorts of companies are you working with? I'm working with about a dozen companies as either a board of director or board of advisor in the digital marketing space or in the emerging media space. There's so much innovation that's happening in advertising today to help marketers spend their budgets more efficiently or with more impact or to take advantage of the social platforms. Um, new mobile platforms. So I'm experiencing kind of like innovation right, you know, as it's happening with many of these companies. What sort of trends are you seeing in the advertising marketplace? Well, there, there are a lot of trends happening in the advertising marketplace. Um, the mega trend is one that's been happening over the past decade and is continuing to accelerate. And that is that media is becoming more fragmented. Media channels are becoming more fragmented. They're more TV channels, there sure. are more digital websites, you know, um, more platforms, social media, mobile media. So, so the time that the consumer spends with media is just in lots of different places, and they're becoming harder to reach. They're almost becoming, um, they're, they're advertising avoidant. <laughs> So uh, they You're talking the average consumer. The average consumer. We see more message skipping. Um, you know, we, we see more of a tuning out of message because it's just becoming, you know, uh, overwhelming. Uh, there are so many advertising right. messages sort of like that we encounter overload, in a day. Right. And then we also see uh, people actually participating in messages themselves. So, you know, getting information from other consumers versus the marketers themselves. So for, for marketers, the frustration is that it's harder and harder to spend the same amount of budget with the same impact and, and, and efficiency. Have you noticed amongst the challenges you're facing any rules of thumb or techniques that have been particularly effective even in the sort of media being awash with sensory overload, et cetera? There's no particular one way to come about things, but there are a lot of missed opportunities right now. So I, I would give you mobile as an example. Of mobile users today, more than 50% have smartphones. Sure. And almost a third of web traffic is through mobile platforms. And yet, a tiny, tiny fraction 
of budgets are going toward mobile, mobile marketing or reaching people through the mobile platform. So that's a gap, you know, where the consumer is way ahead of marketers. And we're seeing advertisers race to catch up. They want to understand the mobile uh, platform. They want to figure out how to reach people there, but they haven't done that yet. And they haven't proven yet to themselves that the mobile medium can work but for them. But how is that going to work? Because we get inundated with pop-up ads when we're on our computer. We get robocalls on our telephones. We get email attachments, etc. Are you suggesting that when you go to open up your telephone, you're going to see an advertisement? Right now, a lot of marketers are translating mobile advertising to a tiny little banner, um, just like you would see maybe on a computer screen, only it's a fraction of that size. So sure. they've done what they did in digital years ago, which is kind of try to translate advertising to the computer screen. And, you know, it took a while to figure out how to make the, the creative exciting. Um, but there are really big opportunities um, in mobile to reach consumers while they're out and about in retail and give them messages in in the time and place where they're ready to make a purchase decision. So interesting. It's Fa fascinating it, stuff. Yeah. You're watching the language of business. I'm Greg Stoller and we're talking with Sarah Fay, a marketing industry thought leader. She spends a lot of time meeting with startups in the digital marketing space, working on their boards and in what she refers to as real time marketing. So in preparation for the segment and knowing you as I do, there's a great debate out there as to whether social media success is defined as gut feel because it's so new or the implementation of traditional pure play marketing analytics. How do you come out on that debate? Well, so real-time marketing is an exciting space, and I think that both gut feel and analytics have a role to play. So think about, okay, everyone is using the um, Oreo cookie example um, from the Super Bowl. I don't know if you saw the I, I Oreo. Know, well, yep, okay, yep. So, so Oreo runs a 30-second a, 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 a spot. It says, follow us on Instagram. And I don't know how many follows they got during that time. I, I'm sure it was millions, you know, right. millions, right. And then during the blackout of the Super Bowl, they serve up a, an Instagram picture of a of, of a cookie and a glass of milk in the dark, and it says, you can still dunk in the dark. That was only something that, that could have been done through intuition and gut feel with, with just an understanding that the relevancy of the moment was going to get them attention. Um, that said, analytics can also play a huge role in real-time marketing. Um, I work with a company called Social Flow that tells you what your fan base or even other fan bases are talking about in the moment and allows you to tweet a message about what your fans are talking about. And that actually gets you more shares and it gets you more responses. You know, it just makes sense. But, you know, that's amazing information to be able to take advantage of that you would never know unless you actually had the access to the analytics. So as you're sitting around the boardroom table and they're talking about corporate strategy, how much credence do today's executives really give to the marketing plan? There's sales, there's engineering, there's profitability concerns from the CFO. How does marketing stack up uh, around that board table? Well, I'm, I mean, you know, lots of times, okay, I work with a lot of startups and the product comes right. first. And I, and I believe the product should come first, especially in this day and age, because the product really has to work in order to gain credibility and in, and in order to, you know, get people supporting the product. Um, social media has had that effect. I right. mean, anybody who goes to a restaurant these days, you know, is probably going oh, to check Open Table or Yelp. Right. If, the, if it's not actually good, then don't bother marketing it if people aren't saying good things about it. Um, but, I, you know, so who you are as a company is a very important part of marketing, and marketing plays a role in that. Beyond that, I think, you know, marketing is really everything you know it it is it's what you say about yourself it's what you want other people to say about you um, it's you know it's what you're going to be in the future and you know what do you predict is going to be the single biggest change to the way marketing's done over the next three to five years TV advertising has continued to, to go up right. actually 
but money is coming out of other forms of media and into digital. And I think also people are trying to take advantage of cross-media opportunities. So for consumers who have their attention divided between platforms to try and find ways of, of gaining their attention through those platforms. A really good example is when you watch The Voice, people are tweeting right. at the same time. And, and actually, that kind of cross-platform interaction time, is making right. you more engaged with the show. Well, advertisers are trying to get people in, involved with the message. So it's, it's really just about engaging consumers and trying to find uh, ways of getting them to participate with brands. Thanks, Sarah. Now that we've looked at two different approaches to implementing the contents of the marketing plan, let's meet a serial entrepreneur in the midst of building his latest company, but who also moonlights as a regularly performing guitarist and bass player. Drew Hanna is coming up next on The Language of Business. Known for an ability to work well with founders and executive teams, and to provide hands-on CEO-level counseling to maximize profits and to accelerate growth, Drew Hanna is my next guest. In addition to his advisory work, Drew has also personally led three venture-backed business transformations for growth, resulting in acquisition, either as a CEO or as a vice president of sales and marketing. Drew, welcome to The Language of Business. Hey, good to be here, Greg. So what startup are you currently running or advising? Well, I'm currently working with a company that's beyond the startup stage. We're in a, an expansion stage, and we provide a SaaS-based retail service for major omni-channel retailers like the people that sell uh, cell phones and uh, Verizon, AT&T, uh, stores of that nature. And for the benefit of our viewers, SAS stands for? Uh, software as a Service. Okay. And how do you find these opportunities, or better yet, how do they find you? Well, typically I'm working with uh, companies that are venture-backed, and very often the venture investors uh, believe there's more potential performance that uh, uh, is afforded by the market conditions. So often I get referred into these companies by the investors. Now, given your impressive track record of success in multiple industries and over multiple time frames, is there a template that you use or a formula when navigating a company from its introductory to its growth trajectory, or is it really that individualized? Well, you know, I don't think there's a formula involved here, but there, uh, I've observed there are a lot of similarities, regardless of the industry, that have more to do with the stage of growth that the company is at. So you might uh, be looking at a company at the very early stage where they haven't uh, actually proven out the business model. And uh, I think the popular term is pivots. Uh, a management team may go through a number of pivots at that stage to lock in on a business model. The next set of steps really, though, are about getting on a rail and scaling that business through repeatable processes, uh, being clear about who the target customer is and what the unmet need is, and then having the programs that support that mission. So today's episode is focused on marketing plan implementation, and sometimes marketing metrics, while carefully developed and analyzed, have to be changed based on moves by the feedback or the competition. How do you sort of come out on that debate, et cetera? Well, I think, I think it's very important to pay attention to the numbers and to pay attention to what the marketplace is telling you. One of the most effective things I've uh, observed and I've used as a tool is to conduct an in-depth win-loss analysis and really examine closely what are the commonalities and the differences between the companies that bought the product and the companies that chose not to buy the product. And what are you analyzing for the win and what are you analyzing for the loss? Well, you really want to understand what the unique capabilities of the product are that are appealing to the customer. And in the case of the, of the losses, you want to understand why uh, the sales organization might be spending time on deals where it isn't a fit, or perhaps there's communication issues or things of that nature. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So many executives today are focused on measurable goals versus marketing objectives. What's the difference and how do you overlay that into your win-loss grid that you just mentioned a few moments ago? Well, measurable goals are key. I mean, it, and it's basically just uh, like what we learned back in grade school, the scientific method. You start right. with a an hypothesis and then you test it in the marketplace. And in this case, the hypothesis we're testing is our business model, our business plan, our value proposition. Sure. So you want to be gathering that data and you want to constantly be adjusting based on that. Those are the objectives. What about the goals? 
Well, the goals can be more broad than that, yeah. and it might have to do with uh, uh, the progress in entering a new market. It might have to do with um, uh, existing markets and the ability to expand there. And I think it's really important to understand uh, from the point of view of where you intend to have growth, is it because you're selling additional things, new features to existing customers, or are we taking our product into new markets? And uh, understanding the, the differences between those situations and the level of risk. Is your value it, it, add to whoever you're advising, et cetera? Well, it, it's really important for the team to understand those things. Terrific. You're watching The Language of Business. I'm Greg Stoller, and we're talking with Drew Hanna, who is both an entrepreneur and an advisor to startups. So on top of all of this, how do you find time to perform as a guitarist? <laughs> oh, well, that's a great question. Um, it's, uh, it's a hobby, and uh, honestly, I don't find as much time as I'd like to find uh, to be doing that. But I think in any business, um, if, you're going to, uh, if you're going to perform at your best, you have to take care of yourself. And having good outside interests and having a balanced life, I think that's really important. Something I've found, Drew, this is, that has always fascinated me is CEOs, startups, presidents, if you will, often have a number of close confidants, one or two people who they turn to both in good times and bad to say, could you give me some advice or let me bounce something off of you. Rarely is the vice president of marketing one of those confidants. What do you think is the reason for that? And in spite of this, how have you managed to be so successful in your advisory work? Right. Well, I think uh, what's uh, worked well for me is the fact that I can appreciate the issues that the CEO and the leadership team are facing uh, pretty much at the executive and board level. Having operated that, at that level myself, um, I can bring that perspective to the dialogue. And uh, at that level, typically the CEO doesn't, you know, may, may talk to a board member, may talk to an investor, but they have an agenda. And in my working relationship with my clients, um, I'm there to support them, uh, and that's my agenda. What do you think has been your biggest success and your biggest failure so far? <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, my biggest success really has been uh, uh, maybe outside of business uh, and uh, successfully raising uh, three children and being great married answer. for 33 great years. Answer, yeah. uh, you know, in business, I had a, a terrific win right. uh, with uh, a company called Softbridge, which we uh, grew very rapidly and was acquired by uh, Teradyne. Um, I thought that was a terrific win. It was a lot of fun, but actually I learned more from uh, the outcome of a guitar business that uh, I was running that uh, did not produce uh, a high return for the investors. And uh, sometimes those uh, battle scars are where you learn more. Of course. So in the last few years of a startup, are you trying to grab an increasingly larger share of the existing pie, or are you simply trying to increase the size of the pie itself? Yeah. that that question really depends on the market situation. The, uh, the whole issue that uh, a company is balancing at that stage is really about focus. And is there a way to get uh, to your growth goals more quickly by staying focused in the, on the path that you're on or by identifying adjacent market categories? And it's a matter of balancing the risk and reward of taking those kinds of chances. How do you think you integrate best with other departments? Uh, is it always marketing first and the other departments are supporting marketing or is it often the antithesis? Well, I think the role of marketing really is to understand the needs of the customer and make sure that everybody in the company understands that, that story, that mission. And I think to the extent that the entire team can be clear about that, everybody will be marching in the same direction. And do you tend to rely more on gut feel or the, the results or the review of hard-based analytical studies, et cetera? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a numbers guy. And one of the things that I've recognized as I've uh, gone through more years of experience is I need to trust my gut a little bit more. So my natural tendency is to go get data and get lots of data and uh, then get some more data. Right. Uh, so I'm learning to trust my gut. I think there's a balance there. Thank you, Drew. You're welcome. Today, we looked at the pros and cons of using different implementation approaches for the marketing section of the business plan. Next time on The Language of Business, we'll move from discussing marketing to building a strong management team in the organizational section of the same document. I'm Greg Stoller. Thank you for watching The Language of Business. If you have a business in need of consulting assistance, or are an entrepreneur looking to develop a business plan, we may be able to help. 
Contact me, Greg Stoller, via email or through Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. I look forward to hearing from you.